Hey, it's Rick Kettner here. Let's explore three of my favorite insights from Hooked by Nir Eyal. This book is all about how to create habit-forming products or services to increase user engagement. It's ideal for anyone out there creating a product or service that could better serve customers through repeat usage or ongoing engagement over time. So whether you're an entrepreneur, marketer, a product developer, anyone that's driving user engagement or trying to drive behavioral change, I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of this book, familiarize yourself with the four-step hook model that is covered in the book, and look for opportunities where you can apply these ideas to make your products or services more likely to drive repeat usage and engagement over time. Now, before I actually dive into some of my favorite insights, I quickly wanna mention that there is a fine line between creating positive habits that serve the interests of your customers and negative addictions that actually abuse these strategies for the business's personal gain. So really fine line there. It's something that we are gonna come back to later in this episode. It's also something that is addressed very well in the book itself. It's important to be aware of this. It's important to think about these things because obviously as entrepreneurs, as business people, anyone out there creating a product or service, we wanna create good in the world. We wanna serve our customers. We wanna serve their needs first and foremost. But there is this very slippery slope where we can move from healthy, productive habits to unhealthy and negative addiction. So just something to be aware of as we go through this and we will address this later on in the episode. But for now, let's start with insight number one. Habits can drive unprompted user engagement. The core premise of the book is that habits can be used to bring people back to your products and services in an ongoing way, rather than relying on things like external triggers such as advertising, promotions, email campaigns, all kinds of things that ultimately cost time, energy, or money that could increase the cost of the product, or if it's something you decided to forego because it was simply too much work or too much involved in making it happen, would result in customers not necessarily engaging with your product or service as much as is necessary for them to really benefit from whatever it is that you offer. So for example, if you offered online guitar lessons and the success of customers relied on them coming back to the product or service in an ongoing way, and you found that one of the best ways to drive that engagement was to invest heavily when it comes to social media posts or email campaigns or even paid marketing to make sure that people re-engage, come back to your product or service, and make use of it. Well, of course, that contributes to the overall cost of the product or service. And again, if you were to simply eliminate those costs and you didn't follow up, then maybe customers would join and then a few weeks later, they would drop off, lose interest, and they wouldn't really learn what they intended to learn and thus would be less likely to recommend your products and services to other people. So in either case, not exactly an ideal situation, which is where habits come in. So if you can establish habits where customers come back and re-engage with your product or service out of a habitual nature rather than having to be prompted, then all kinds of positive things happen. And they talk about these in the book, including things like higher lifetime customer value, greater pricing flexibility, because if you're confident that people will come back and re-engage with your product, then you can switch to a subscription model where they pay out over time as opposed to one big upfront lump sum. And there's increased effectiveness, obviously, because if you're confident, again, that people are gonna engage over time, then you have more time to create value for them, and it's more likely that they're gonna benefit from your product, and again, more likely that they're gonna go out and share and recommend your products and services to other people. And all of this together, between higher customer lifetime value, greater pricing flexibility, and increased effectiveness, this all, of course, leads to supercharged growth relative to a competitor that might not be benefiting from this habit creation process. Now, when it comes to actually creating habits, this takes us to insight number two, how you can establish habits using the hook model. The idea here is the model includes four phases, four different steps that someone would pass through every time they complete the habit loop. And these include number one, trigger, number two, action, number three, variable reward, and number four, investment. So the first phase is simply to trigger them in some way to come and use your product or service. And as I mentioned earlier, typically this involves external triggers like advertising or paid promotion or maybe celebrity endorsement or some other examples might include things like media coverage, viral content, 
invitations from either the business itself or from other users of the product or service. But this is typically what kicks off the hook loop is you have some kind of an external trigger that prompts the user to take action. The long-term goal here though, is to switch over from external triggers to internal triggers where someone is guided by an internal emotion of some kind or a mental association. For example, they might have a feeling of loneliness, boredom, frustration, confusion, maybe a desire to grow or learn or adapt. And that whichever emotion is relevant to your product or service or what it is that you offer people, you would create a linkage between the two so that when they had a certain emotion, like for example, loneliness, maybe they would turn to your social media network app as an opportunity to connect with friends, friends and family, or at least see updates from friends or family. So that's the idea here. The first step is trigger. You need a trigger. You start with external, but eventually, ideally, you switch over to internal triggers so that you don't have to pay or spend money or do anything else that might cost you time, energy, or money to bring them back. The second step is action. So of course, once you've prompted somebody or they've had an internal trigger that prompts them, they need to take some kind of an action, some kind of an action that relates to your product or service. And ideally, you want this to be a relatively small action right off the bat, their first engagement with your product or service. You can slowly increase this, but generally speaking, the smaller the action, the more likely it is that someone is gonna create this habit loop. So for example, this might include opening an app, checking a social feed, starting a video lesson, logging their food. Let's say if you're running some kind of a diet app and somebody had to check in you know, three times a day after mealtime to log their food, they're taking an action. Maybe they're feeling focused on this and they have this internal goal to lose weight. And so because of that, they're prompted to come back to your app. Or maybe you set up external triggers like automatic email alerts or notifications with the app. But the point is the second step, they have to take an action. They have to take some kind of an action to keep the habit loop moving forward. And as the book explains, there are three requirements for someone to take an action. The first is they must have sufficient motivation. The second is they have to have the ability or the capacity to complete the step, which might seem obvious, but very important to take note of. And the third is a trigger must be present, hence this being the second step in the process, which was initiated with a trigger. So that's the idea here. And again, generally speaking, the smaller, the simpler the action is, the better. And the book goes into so much more detail about how to select the right action, but you need them to take some kind of an action after the trigger. That leads them to the, to the third step, which is very, variable reward. So your product or service needs to solve some, some kind of a problem. There needs to be some kind of a reward or a payoff or some kind of benefit when they take action. And so if they launch the app, there needs to be something there for them that provides a sense of relief or reward or scratches their itch in some way. If they are feeling lonely, they launch Instagram, they have this feeling of connectedness with somebody and that is a sense of reward. Really important though, to be highly effective, this needs to be variable reward. There needs to be some variance, some novelty here, because if people launch your product or your service, or whether it's a physical product, whether it's a digital app, whatever it might be, if every single time they use it, they get a very predictable, obvious reward, then very likely they're gonna lose interest over time. So variance is really important here. This is where social media networks, for all the downsides, and there are many downsides, one thing they do exceptionally well in terms of creating these habits is every time you come back to the app, there's a huge degree of variance and variance matters. It's not so much about having the person feel rewarded every single time. In many cases, having it be hit or miss creates this addiction or creates this habit because they come back because they don't know when the reward is gonna be a great reward or when it's gonna be eh, so-so. This is one of the reasons why, you know, push email is such a huge addiction because when you hear that ding of your cell phone saying you've got a new email, you don't know if it's an important email or not an important email. And in fact, that not knowing, that uncertainty makes it more addictive. Because if you knew every time it was an important email, you would actually think, okay, I'm gonna handle all my important emails a little bit later. But since you don't know, there's this weird thing that happens where all of a sudden we feel more interested in solving the uncertainty and figuring out whether or not 
it's important. So that's the third stage, variable reward. The fourth and final is investment. So the idea here is over time, every time somebody passes through this habit loop and this four-step process, you want them to make some kind of an investment into the platform or the product or service itself. And this investment should be proportional to the amount of value they're getting out of the service at that time. So you don't wanna ask them to make a huge investment right off, the big, right off the top, their first interaction with the app, but over time, you can ask for a larger, larger investment. And the reason why people are willing to make an investment is it drives anticipation of future rewards or future benefits with the product or service. So for example, if somebody just signed up for Twitter the first time, they got some kind of an external trigger and they decided, okay, it's time to finally sign up for Twitter. They might take the action of installing the app, launching the app. They might get the variable reward of seeing some new stuff in their feed. And they might make an investment in the app in some way, like following a few interesting people on the platform. A very modest investment. Let me give you a few examples, a few further examples of the kinds of small investments people could make. Adding content to the platform, adding data to a personal profile, building connections with other people on the platform, earning reputation among the community of people using the product or service, whatever it might be. Learning a skill. This is something that applies to virtually any product or service. Learning some kind of a skill that makes them more proficient or more invested in this specific product or service. So it's not a skill resulting from them using your service. It's not like you taught them how to play piano. It's learning a skill that makes it easier for them to benefit from your product or service. So if you offered something like Google's Gmail, if they learned a tip or a trick or a slight nuance of how to use Gmail more effectively, well, they've learned a skill that directly contributes to their ability to use the product. And so they've made a personal investment in terms of learning how to use it more effectively, and now they're more likely to come back to it for in the future because they know they're now more capable of getting more value out of that particular product or service. So those are the four different phases, trigger, action, variable reward, and investment. And when done properly, people are gonna come back and go through this loop over and over again. They're gonna eventually develop internal triggers. If you've identified the right internal triggers, they're gonna take actions, you're gonna deliver variable rewards, and they're gonna to continue to make investments in the platform that cause them to wanna to come back and repeat the cycle over and over again. Now, as I hinted at earlier, there is this fine line between habit and addiction. And so the concern here is obviously, if you're trying to do right by your customers, you don't want to form an unhealthy addiction. You don't want negative outcomes. So with that in mind, let's move on to insight number three, how to use habits for positive outcomes. The ideal use of this strategy is to help customers achieve something they already want to achieve, to help them accomplish something that is meaningful to them, but for one reason or another, they aren't able or haven't yet been able to accomplish it on their own. So for example, maybe they lack the motivation, maybe they lack the follow through, maybe they lack the systematic approach and they need support or encouragement or a community to help them accomplish ultimately something that they deep down have always wanted to accomplish, or at least more recently have wanted to accomplish. So for example, staying organized, losing weight, learning a new skill, something like this. Maybe you're gonna help them learn how to play the guitar, how to cook healthy meals, how to get in the best shape of their life, how to learn a new language, whatever it might be, you're serving their interests. You're helping them solve something they've always wanted to accomplish as opposed to maybe they had a passing interest in something and you helped them create an addiction to it for your own gain and really it wasn't serving them and it was causing them to be more addicted to a behavior than they were actually interested in pursuing. Now, really important to note, not every situation is gonna be black and white. It's not always gonna be crystal clear whether or not you're serving them first and foremost, or you're starting to kind of abuse something they're interested in to really serve your own interests. So the book brings up a lot on this subject, but one of the more interesting things in my mind are the two questions they ask to really try to differentiate between whether or not you're approaching this in the right way. The first question is, would I use the product myself? And the second question is, Will the product help users materially improve their lives? So if your answer to this, if there's any hesitation whatsoever before you can answer with a confident yes, then you really want to 
revisit your strategy. Because if you can't confidently, with total certainty, answer yes, that you would use the product yourself, and that yes, it will help customers improve their lives in a meaningful way, then you're almost certainly offering something to people that is not in their best interest. And at the end of the day, the best and most successful businesses out there, both in terms of their ability to generate revenue and to create a positive impact in the world and to be rewarding for both the founders and for the team at large, is to serve the long-term interest of your customers. There's always this temptation to close the sale or extract maximum value from your customers, but the best businesses are the businesses that really, at the end of the day, focus on serving the long-term needs of their customers because they establish a much stronger brand. They have customers that are gonna recommend their products and services to other people. And of course, just as a team, whether you're the founder or whether you're any other member of the team, you're gonna feel that much more rewarded having provided a positive impact on the world. So those are my three favorite insights from the book. Let me just quickly recap them here. Number one, habits can drive unprompted user engagement. Number two, you can establish habits using the hook model. And number three, how to use habits for positive outcomes. Of course, there's so much more covered in the book. We just touched the surface when it came to the four-step process in the hook model. If you actually want to implement what we've talked about here in this episode, then I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of the book. You can get it in the physical version, the digital or the audiobook version if you prefer and go through it in detail so much more information and advice in terms of how to accomplish each of these steps more effectively and so i recommend that you check that out if you have any questions or comments or thoughts about anything that we covered here let me know down in the comment section below if you happen to be listening to the audio edition i'll include a link in the show notes that you can use to go to the video edition so you can participate in the comment section there if you're interested in more content like this in the future, I recommend that you subscribe or follow my updates on social media. That way you won't miss out on future episodes. Thank you for tuning in and I look forward to connecting with you either in the comments below or in a future episode.